Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before I go to your questions, I just wanted to make one quick announcement at the top. Later this afternoon, the President will uh, sign into law the two-month surface transportation patch that was passing, uh, passed by the Senate and the House last week. This is the 33rd short-term fix for the Highway Transportation Trust Fund since 2008. The 33rd. Democrats and Republicans acknowledge uh, that investments in infrastructure are critical to our economy, both over the long term, but also uh, in terms of the short-term impact that they could have to strengthen our economy and create jobs. But these kinds of short-term patches are also not beneficial to our economy. Uh, they're, according to one estimate, that the uncertainty around the Highway Trust Fund has led a number of states to delay projects totaling $2 billion, or nearly $2 billion. Uh, again, that's two, mil two billion fewer dollars going into our economy in the form of paychecks for workers, uh, in the form of uh, contracts going to small businesses, uh, in the form of investments that we know would derive a much larger economic benefit uh, for communities across the country if they benefited from uh, a modern, efficient, upgraded transportation infrastructure. So it's the President's view that the era of short-term patches and chronic underinvestment in our transportation infrastructure must come to an end. The President's put forward a common-sense proposal for closing loopholes that only benefit the wealthy and well-connected and using revenue from that tax reform to making investments in the kind of infrastructure that benefit everybody. Uh, and the President is going to continue to urge Congress uh, to take steps in that direction. Uh, again, not because it's the President's preference, although it is, uh, but because of the important benefits for our economy. Uh, so with that, Julie, we'll Any go to your questions. You uh, I do not anticipate that there will be coverage of it today. Any money for the Memorial Bridge? Uh, I'd refer you to the Department of Transportation about whether or not the, uh, the upgrades that are needed for the Memorial Bridge uh, would benefit from this uh, particular piece of legislation. Julie. Thanks, Josh. Um, I just want to start with Cuba. Yes. Does officially taking Cuba off the state sponsor of terror list essentially clear the way for announcements on opening embassies? And if so, what, how quickly should we expect those announcements? Uh, Julie, you recall that Cuban diplomats were in the United States last week uh, meeting with American diplomats at the State Department to resolve a number of issues. Uh, related to normalizing relations between the United States and Cuba. Uh, Cuba's inclusion on the state sponsor of terror list uh, was just one of those issues. So there, are, there continue to be issues that need to be worked out. Uh, in the discussions that were convened last week, there was important progress that was made. Uh, I don't have it, uh, a time frame to give you in terms of any specific announcement, uh, but that obviously is uh, among the next milestones here. Uh, which is the opening of a Cuban embassy here in the United States and the opening of an American embassy on the island of Cuba. But you're saying there are still unresolved issues that are going to prevent you for some period of time from doing that? Uh, as of right now, uh, there are additional issues that our diplomats are working through uh, before we uh, can reach an agreement about that would yield the uh, opening of uh, embassies. Uh, this weekend marks the end of the agreement that the U.S. has had with Qatar to keep the five Taliban detainees uh, in Doha. Should we expect that there will be an, ex an extension of that agreement, that they will be uh, continue to have a ban on their <coughs> travel, or will they be free after this weekend to, to travel as they please? I don't have any announcements on this matter uh, that I'm prepared to deliver today. But it is true that the United States has been in touch with our partners in Qatar. Uh, about the kinds of steps that we believe are important to protecting the national security of the American people. Uh, you'll recall that prior to the transfer of these, de of these detainees taking place, we had reached uh, agreements with Qatar uh, about uh, limitations that could be placed on these individuals that would protect uh, our national security. And that's ultimately why, the, why then Secretary of Defense Hagel certified that this transfer could be conducted consistent with uh, our national security goals. Uh, and uh, we continue to be in touch with the Qataris about steps that we believe are necessary to protect the American people. And do those steps include extending the travel ban? Well, we're talking to them about a range of issues, and when we have an announcement on this, we'll let you know. Would the President be comfortable with these former detainees being free to travel? Well, uh, 
what the president believes is important is for us to make sure that we have in place uh, the conditions that are necessary to protect the American people. Uh, and what exactly that entails is not something I can talk about here because it's something that we're talking about with the Qataris right now. Uh, but when we do have an announcement on this, we'll let you know. And would you expect to have an announcement by the time this one-year agreement expires? I wouldn't make any promises on the on the deadline, but we'll um, we'll certainly keep uh, you apprised of uh, uh, of the conclusion of those talks. Okay, Jeff. Josh, um, Mr. Blatter has won the re-election as the head of the soccer body FIFA. Uh, does the White House have a response to that? Uh, we do not. Uh, it's the uh, members of that organization cast votes to choose their president, and uh, that's apparently what they've done. Do you um, feel like you that the United States has lost confidence in him, given the controversy and the start of the prosecution this week? Well, I wouldn't speak to the, even the degree of confidence that we had in Mr. Blatter uh, prior to uh, the uh, latest uh, announcements about the uh, Department of Justice investigation. So uh, I'll reserve comment uh, on this. This is a, a decision for uh, that uh, organization that's now in some turmoil uh, for them to make, and uh, we'll let them make it. We had a chance to ask Eric a couple, a couple of times on the plane about the President's reaction, the White House's reaction, more generally to the controversy with the soccer organization. Chancellor Merkel has weighed in, Prime Minister of uh, Britain has weighed <coughs> in. How does the President feel now about this controversy going on in the soccer community at large? Well, uh, I think I'll just say, uh, something you've heard me say on uh, other similar occasions, uh, which is that this is the subject of an ongoing uh, Department of Justice criminal investigation. Uh, and in this case, I think uh, we'll leave that investigation in the hands, uh, or in this case, maybe it's appropriate to say at the feet of the career prosecutors who are leading the investigation. Let me uh, move to just one other topic. Uh, is the White House monitoring the protests in, in Phoenix? Um, in which participants have been asked to draw uh, pictures of the Prophet Muhammad, and do you have any reaction to that? Uh, I've read some of the news reports uh, about this event that's being planned, uh, and let me just reiterate uh, what, what, what I've said when uh, I've learned of previous gatherings like this, uh, which is uh, that uh, even um, expressions that are uh, offensive, uh, that are distasteful uh, and intended to sow divisions uh, in an otherwise tight-knit, diverse community like Phoenix uh, cannot be used as a justification to carry out an act of violence uh, and certainly can't be used as, an, as a justification to carry out an act of terrorism. Uh, and uh, the Department of Homeland Security is aware of this event. Uh, and as they were in advance of the previous event that was uh, convened earlier this month, I believe. The Department of Homeland Security has been in touch with uh, state and local law enforcement authorities. Uh, and we're going to continue to monitor uh, the situation. Michelle? Uh, the meeting today with Attorney General Lynch, was that organized because of the possible expiration of parts of the Patriot Act? And how would you characterize the kind of outreach, if any, that the administration has been able to do with members of Congress this week, despite their being away? The uh, meeting that the President uh, will have later this afternoon with the Attorney General is uh, just a routine meeting. It's part of the regular slate of meetings that the President has with his Attorney General. Uh, that was true of the previous Attorney General, and it's, it's true of this one. Uh, it's apparent from reading the newspapers that they've got plenty to talk about. Um, and I think this issue will be at the top of the agenda. And I don't have uh, detailed conversations to share with you, but uh, even though uh, members of the United States Senate uh, left town for a week at the end of last week with a really important piece of business left undone, uh, the administration has been in touch with senators uh, over the last week to uh, urge them to do the one thing that will eliminate uh, unnecessary risk to our national security, uh, and that is to pass the USA Freedom Act, a piece of legislation that both uh, extends important but non-controversial law enforcement authorities and implements reforms that are critical to protecting the privacy and civil liberties of the American people. 
Uh, this is a piece of legislation that uh, accomplishes those two uh, top priorities that earn the strong support of Democrats and Republicans in the House of Representatives. It got 338 votes of Democrats and Republicans in the House. Uh, and the Senate should act before the deadline to pass that piece of legislation. And we heard Jen Psaki yesterday um, talk about Rand Paul and, and his role in this. Uh, and she mentioned that he has presidential aspirations and that maybe he should put those aside for now. So is the White House saying that his concerns about surveillance aren't legitimate and they're more related to his aspirations? Well, I'll, I'll let you guys make that assessment. What I will tell you. But she said that. What, what I will tell you is that the President's concerned about making sure that the privacy and civil liberties of the American people are protected. That's why the President, in a speech at the Department of Justice uh, almost a year and a half ago, called for this program to be reformed. That's why the President dispatched his national security team to travel to Capitol Hill uh, last year to begin conversations with relevant Democrats and Republicans about how these authorities could be reformed in a way that would boost public confidence uh, but would also protect the ability of our law enforcement and national security professionals to keep the country safe. And they hammered out that, that, that bipartisan agreement. And this legislation, if passed, would effectively put the federal government out of business of collecting and holding uh, bulk data. And that is, uh, that is the stated goal of many members of the United States Senate, both Democrats and Republicans. And we would expect all of those Democrats and Republicans who share that goal to vote for this bill. So based on what you said, you clearly feel that, that it is politics that's marring this process that would otherwise be agreed upon. Well, there's no, I haven't heard, I mean, as, uh, as we spent some time talking about a, a week ago today, I haven't heard a rational explanation for what exactly is going on in the United States Senate right now. There's no good explanation for it. We've, there are members of the United States Senate who are deeply concerned about making sure our national security professionals have all the tools they need to keep us safe, but yet they're blocking a piece of legislation, the USA Freedom Act, that would do exactly that. We've heard other members of the United States Senate say that they are deeply concerned with protecting the privacy and civil liberties of the American people, and yet they're blocking a piece of legislation that would do exactly that. It's called the USA Freedom Act. So it's been very difficult for anybody to offer up a satisfactory explanation or even a, a rational explanation, even an unsatisfactory rational explanation uh, for what exactly they're doing up there. Uh, and so hopefully they'll be able to um, come back after uh, uh, eight or nine days of clearing their heads uh, and uh, put the best interests of the country and our citizens and our national security first. What about that Super PAC ad, um, sort of portraying this as a big rumble on, su on Sunday? Um, it's in support of Rand Paul, but uh, kind of making this into a wrestling match, uh, including, I might add, a shirtless Rand Paul <coughs> versus Barack Obama in this ad. Well, I haven't seen the ad, but I will say, I, will say uh, I haven't seen the ad, but you have piqued my interest. So let's put that on the to-do list for this afternoon, guys. Do you think that's important? We'll check that out. I mean, don't you think that my could, could you say that it's in poor taste or, or I don't know, yeah. portraying the wrong things to the American public? I would say that there is a, a pretty long history in the Commonwealth of Kentucky uh, of pretty heated feuds going all the way back to the Hatfields and McCoys. <laughs> and the fact is there seems to be a feud right now between the leader of the United States Senate, Mitch McConnell, a native of Kentucky, um, and Senator Paul. Uh, unfortunately, the, the victim of that feud right now is the um, amount of risk that's facing our national security and legislation that would protect the privacy and civil liberties of our people. Thank you. All right, move around. April. Uh, Josh, I want to follow up on what Michelle is talking about. The President asked for this meeting, we understand it. You said it was a routine meeting but we understand that he asked for this meeting. It wasn't a regularly scheduled meeting. So is there, now from my sources from over justice, they said it was something that the president had asked for. So with that. I think the president asked to meet with his attorney general on a fairly regular basis. So I wouldn't read too much into uh, the who, who uh, extended the invitation. Okay. Well, with that, um, in, in looking ahead at Sunday, there are two options. It could be extended, passed, or what have you, or it could 
there needs to be a plan B coming from the White House. What is the plan B, and is that something that the President and Loretta Lynch will be discussing if indeed the Senate does not come back, if indeed this is not dealt with? Well, uh, April, as we've said a couple of times now, uh, the possibility of a plan B is not something that's on the agenda because it doesn't exist. There is no plan B. There is no executive action that the President can take to uh, give our law enforcement and national security professionals the tools they need, uh, all of the tools that they need, including the tools that are included uh, in the USA Freedom Act. Uh, now, what our national security professionals will tell you is that they will, uh, if faced with a scenario in which they have some of these tools taken out of their toolbox, uh, they will try to uh, use all of the tools that they currently have uh, to do what's necessary to keep us safe. And uh, the point that I w would make is that taking those tools away seems like an unnecessary risk. I, I, can't, I, I can't necessarily say, for you, say to you that our national security professionals at 6 a.m. on Monday uh, are going to need to be able to use uh, Section 215, even the routine use of Section 215, which is not at all controversial. Uh, but why would we take the chance? And more importantly, why are we taking the chance? There's no, again, there's no rational explanation uh, for the Senate not acting in bipartisan fashion to pass a piece of legislation that already has a strong bipartisan support in the House of Representatives. Can we be frank and detailed? And I'm, we're not talking hypothetical. We've been pretty frank up here. No, 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 no. There's some days you can probably accuse me of not being overly no, 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 frank, but. I want more okay. information about when you take these tools out of the toolkit, what yeah. could happen? I mean, you, we, you don't want to talk hypotheticals, but this okay. is a possibility that could happen. What could the American public be in jeopardy of? Or can you give us detail and not talk around, just give us <laughs> frank detail? Yeah. Well, the, there are some very specific authorities that are included in the USA Freedom Act uh, that will lapse. Uh, if the Senate doesn't vote to approve this piece of legislation. The one that has gotten the most attention uh, is this, uh, is the use of Section 215 authority to uh, search uh, bulk data that's collected by telecom companies. And the USA Freedom Act includes reforms that would put the federal government out of the business uh, of holding those records. Uh, and instead, it would require our national security professionals to get a court order uh, and then to search data uh, that is held by the telecommunications companies. Uh, and that is a, a reform that's put in place to uh, ensure that the privacy and civil liberties of the American people are protected. Uh, but what's also true, and that's the, that's the controversial element of this, and this is consistent with the reforms that the President himself called for uh, a year and a half ago. But the reason that our national security, and one of the more important reasons that our uh, national security professionals have raised concerns, is that there are other authorities that are included in this legislation that will also lapse if uh, the Senate doesn't pass this bill. Uh, the first of those is the routine use of Section 215. This is authority that allows our national security professionals, with a court order, to go and obtain business records relating to a suspected terrorist. And by business records, I mean things like hotel records, uh, financial records, bank records, uh, other things that might give them insight into what this suspected terrorist is up to uh, or, or who they might be plotting and planning with. Uh, again, this is a specific authority that's given to our national security professionals by the Congress. Uh, they have to obtain a court order before they can exercise those authorities. Uh, but that's non-controversial. People haven't raised concerns uh, about that, or at least not many people have. Uh, and, it, as, and our national security professionals will tell you it's an important tool for collecting information. There are two other authorities that uh, are included here. The first is uh, what's called the roving wiretap authority. And this gives um, essentially our national security professionals the opportunity to um, monitor the communications of individuals, uh, even it, w again, with a court order. Uh, even if they are uh, changing cell phones rapidly. So, uh, you, you know, you've heard of the term a burner phone, where somebody will use a phone for uh, a day and then move to a different cell phone. 
uh, what this authority gives them, gives our national security professionals, is the authority to essentially follow this person from cell phone to cell phone as they monitor their activities. Uh, the third and final uh, authority uh, is actually an authority that our national security professionals have not used, uh, and it is the uh, lone wolf provision. And this essentially is a uh, is an authority that, again, uh, under a court order, uh, would allow the national our national security apparatus to collect information about a suspected terrorist uh, who is not an American citizen, uh, and even if they are not able to directly link them to a specific terror organization. Uh, and this is an authority that has not been used before, uh, but it is considered by our national security professionals to be an important one. And uh, again, the case that I would make uh, overall here is that it doesn't make sense, and no one has presented a compelling case for why we should take the unnecessary risk of allowing these authorities to lapse. Okay, and on the next question, um, you said the President Obama was not going to support uh, Hillary Clinton at this time for her presidential bid because he's got other friends out there who could be making an announcement. Um, there's a friend that could be making an announcement tomorrow. Uh, Martin O'Malley. What does the President think about Martin O'Malley and his chances? Well, I, I'm not going to handicap his uh, chances from here. He'll have the opportunity to make uh, the case that he would uh, like to Democratic voters. Um, if he chooses to run, uh, he obviously will have a compelling case to make uh, about his record in the state of Maryland uh, as the governor of that state. Um, but I would not anticipate any uh, presidential uh, statement or uh, uh, endorsement in the coming days for any of the candidates in the race at this point. Okay, and lastly, since the president is now on Twitter, is he trolling and looking at some of uh, his favorite reporters, <laughs> uh, tweets? Is he, you know, what's he doing? Is he just watching what people are saying to him? Is he going around looking through the Twitterverse? Yeah. Uh, I would, uh, I can confirm for you that he is not spending much time uh, doing that. He's got a lot of other things on his plate. But he certainly did enjoy the opportunity that he had yesterday uh, to use his, uh, his new Twitter handle to answer some questions and interact with, uh, uh, with the public, uh, some of whom had uh, some direct serious questions to ask him about climate change, uh, and some of whom had direct and serious questions to ask him about the NBA playoffs. And is he aware of some of the hate that has come to him uh, since he's been on the Twitterverse? Uh, yes. John. Uh, Josh, any reaction to the news that former Speaker of the House Dennis Hastert has been uh, indicted? Uh, John, I uh, read those uh, stories in the paper today. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, this falls in the category of an active uh, Department of Justice criminal investigation. Uh, but I think I can uh, speak pretty faithfully for everybody here at the White House that uh, even though uh, Speaker Hastert uh, served as the Speaker of the House in the, uh, in the other party, uh, that there's nobody here who, takes, who derives any pleasure uh, from reading about uh, the former Speaker's uh, legal troubles at this point. What does the president, though, think is, you know, the most prominent uh, political figure uh, from the state of Illinois to see uh, this is a state where, by last count, four of the last seven governors have gone to prison, uh, a member of Congress gone to prison, another member of Congress recently on charges that could end it, send him to prison, and now you have uh, Speaker Hastert, perhaps <laughs> the most prominent outside of the president uh, from the state of Illinois under, under this cloud. What, what does... Uh, what does he make of that? I mean, somebody who came into politics to, you know, get people involved and to restore faith in the political process, but to yeah. see so many top political figures from his state yeah. uh, brought up on charges or, or convicted of charges. Well, it's not. It's not again based only what I've uh, what, what what has been shared publicly. It's not clear that any of the charges that Speaker Hastert is facing uh, are related to his uh, service in uh, uh, in government, either at the local level or uh, in the United States Congress. <laughs> But uh, I do think that, uh, as a more general matter, the responsibility that the Department of Justice has to uh, make sure that our public officials are not violating the public's trust uh, is an important responsibility. Uh, and again, I, I won't speak to any of the specific cases, uh, but uh, the President certainly believes they have an important job to do uh, and uh, expects them to do it. Okay, just one other one quickly. The, you, you've seen the uh, news with the case of Jason Rezaian, the Washington Post reporter held in Iran. One of the pieces of evidence against him apparently was a job application he made to, to come to the Obama administration, which somehow the Iranians see as evidence uh, that he's 
some kind of an American spy? What, what do you make of that? Well, we have said for quite some time that uh, Mr. Zion is being unjustly detained uh, by Iran. Uh, the, you know, we're aware of the reports that his trial has uh, both started and adjourned. Um, we have expressed concerns about the lack of transparency associated with uh, his case, uh, but it's consistent with the pattern that we've seen in Iran uh, of these kinds of, of trials being closed to the public. It certainly does raise questions about uh, the veracity of claims against uh, Mr. Resign. Uh, and that's why we have made clear, both publicly and in private conversations, uh, that, the, that Mr. Resign should be uh, released immediately, and he should be allowed to uh, return to the United States and uh, be reunited with his family. Do you have any indication that either Jason Rezaian, Amir Ahmadi, Saeed Abedini, that any of the Americans now being held prisoner in Iran, as you have said, unjustly, are any closer to being freed or will be freed before any agreement is done uh, on the nuclear deal? Well, John, we have made clear to the Iranians uh, that they should release Mr. Rezaian, uh, Mr. Abedini, and Mr. Hekmadi. They are being unjustly held in Iran and they should be released and allowed to return to the United States so that they can be reunited with their families. Uh, we have also raised, again, both in public and in private with the Iranians, uh, that we would like their assistance and we would like information about the whereabouts of uh, Mr. Levinson. And uh, we've also been clear that we will not allow these American citizens uh, to be used as bargaining chips. We're not going to negotiate for their release. They should be released because they are being unheld uh, they are being held unjustly. And uh, we've made that, again, we've made that clear uh, in public on many, many occasions. The President himself has. Uh, and we've raised concerns about uh, each of these individual cases in private uh, as well, including the President. Uh, and we're going to continue to do so until uh, these American citizens uh, have been released. Okay. Major. Dennis Hastert, what would you say was the President's relationship with him? He was a formidable figure in Illinois politics as well as the Speaker of the House. And some in political circles in Illinois have described them being, themselves being shocked and saddened by this. Would you mm -hmm. say those, any of those adjectives fairly characterize the President's reaction? Could you describe what degree, if any, they had a professional political relationship? Yeah, I, I, um, I did not speak to the President after the news uh, broke late in the day yesterday about this specific case. I do, off the top of my head here, I do not recall having heard the President talk about his relationship uh, with Speaker Hastert. I'm sure they had the occasion to meet at some point, uh, but I'm not aware that they had any, um, uh, any sort of uh, material personal relationship. Uh, when you said at the top that the era must come to an end of short-term highway trust fund extensions. Does that mean the President won't sign another? Well, I, I, I'm not saying anything that declarative. Uh, what I'm saying is that the, well, uh, as bad as the short-term extension uh, is, uh, and this uncertainty that it creates around the highway trust fund uh, has delayed uh, all across the country about $2 billion worth of projects. So this, this kind of uncertainty is, uh, it's bad management, and it's bad for the country, and it's bad for our economy. Uh, but allowing the trust fund to go broke would be worse. So, but we need to actually set our aspirations a little higher than that. Uh, and that's why the President's put forward a very specific plan about, uh, for essentially a six-year proposal that would close loopholes that only benefit the wealthy and well-connected, use the revenue from those reforms, to invest in infrastructure that would benefit everybody. That'd be good for the economy. It would create jobs in the short term. Uh, and it clearly is the right thing to do. I'll, I'll uh, as I have often done, remind you that on the day after the election, uh, Leader McConnell uh, and Speaker Boehner wrote a joint op-ed in the Washington Post, the headline of which was, now we can get Congress moving. Well, we have an opportunity now to literally get America moving uh, by putting in place a modern, uh, upgraded, transportation infrastructure that'd be good for our economy, uh, both in the short term and the long term. And we hope that uh, Leader McConnell and Speaker Boehner will follow through on that promise. Uh, and we certainly have uh, our own very specific ideas about right. how they can start. But you will sign other short-term extensions if necessary. Well, I'm not making any pronouncements about future short-term extensions. 
Uh, what I am saying is that it is not at all in the best interest of the country uh, for the United States Congress to continue to kick the can down the road, even if it's uh, two months at a time. What they need to do is they need to get serious uh, about considering a common sense proposal like the one the President's put forward uh, to make a long-term commitment to the transportation infrastructure of the United States. Uh, back to FIFA for, for a second. Uh, Vladimir Putin left the impression that he thought the United States was meddling in business it ought not to meddle in and trying to extend its jurisdiction in ways it should not by pursuing this criminal prosecution <coughs> of FIFA executives, suggesting that there really was no jurisdiction. This is not the United States Justice Department's business. Your reaction to that? Uh, I'd refer you to the Department of Justice, who can, I'm sure, give you a very detailed explanation uh, about the jurisdiction that they have recognized here uh, to pursue these charges. You disagree, though. Well, I have full confidence in the explanation you, you can receive from the Department of Justice. Speaking of Putin, there, are, there were reports yesterday that some number of thousands of Russian troops with their uniform insignia stri stripped off and with armaments were moving again, as we have seen before, toward parts of eastern Ukraine still in dispute. To what degree does this add or has added to administration concerns about what may come next in that particular part of uh, I haven't seen those specific reports, but I, I will say that the, we do continue to be concerned because what you have just relayed is consistent with the kind of behavior uh, that we've seen by the Russians over the last year and a half or so. And uh, they have repeatedly uh, violated the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And the international community has spoken clearly and with one voice to insist that the that the Russians recognize and respect the sovereignty of their neighbors, including in Ukraine. And you know, the, the Russians have been isolated as a result of this. The Russian government has been heavily sanctioned. Uh, and it's had a significant impact, a negative impact, uh, on their economy. And those costs will continue as long as Russia and President Putin continue to engage in destabilizing activities in Ukraine. Will the G7 summit be a platform to intensify discussion about another round of sanctions? Well, the G7 has obviously been very involved in imposing economic costs on Russia for their destabilizing activities in Ukraine. And I would anticipate that there will be additional discussion of this issue at the G7. Uh, I don't have any outcomes to foreshadow at this point, though. Last question. Uh, there's not just a legislative deadline, but there is this Second Circuit Court of Appeals ruling that the conduct of bulk collection of data, telephony data, is illegal because it is broader than was sanctioned by Congress. If the Patriot Act expires, how significant does that Second Circuit Court of Appeals ruling loom in trying to restart any of this and getting legislative approval for what you're doing now, but you would lose the legislative right to do and have a court opinion saying it's illegal? Yeah. Uh, let me answer that question in two ways. Uh, the first is that this is the concern that we have about the very short-term extensions that have been floated by some members of the Senate. There's been the suggestion that, well, why don't we just extend the life of the Patriot Act by uh, three or four days or a week to give us additional time to tinker with the compromise proposal that's already passed with bipartisan support in the House. And the concern with that is that the Second Circuit has said has raised significant concerns about whether or not the use of that authority can be used to uh, continue to uh, use this, uh, search this information. The good news is that the USA Freedom Act, as passed in the House, our lawyers believe, actually addresses the concerns of the Second Circuit. So rather than to throw into doubt the ability of our law enforcement professionals, to use these authorities based on a ruling from the Second Circuit, we believe we should act quickly to reform that proposal, to reform that program consistent with the concerns that were raised by the Second Circuit. That's how we can be confident that we can prevent a lapse in these authorities 
uh, and make sure that, these, that this information that our law enforcement and national security professionals say is important uh, is something that they'll still have, they'll continue to have um, uninterrupted access to. Since your lawyers have looked at this, if the Patriot Act lapses and you don't have the USA Freedom Act legislation, which talks about a continuation and this transition period from NSA housing of this data to telecoms housing it, do you have to start from scratch legislatively to rewrite authorities at a, for this program and essentially draft a new bill that has to go through both chambers if you lose the authorities you have now and they are not reauthorized <coughs> as the USA Freedom Act envisions, this sort of handover. You have to start from scratch. Uh, I've not, I've not heard that prospect raised. I don't believe that that will be necessary. But what, you know, I, I guess the, the scenario that you're setting up is uh, if Congress blows through the deadline, right? Uh, but five days later they come to their senses and pass the USA Freedom Act, uh, is it still possible to do that? I understand that yes, it is still possible for them to do that, but it would introduce some unnecessary risk in the form of the, that five-day lapse in which our national security professionals would not have access to some tools that they say are important to keep uh, keeping us safe. Okay, Kristen. Josh, thanks. I want to get your reaction. I know you've been talking about Rand Paul. You obviously disagree with him and his tactics, but he makes one argument that I want to get your reaction to. He says that um, the metadata program has never actually stopped an attack. He says that rather it's a, quote, building block tool for investigations. Can you respond to that? I know that the counter argument is that, well, it's a he's using the wrong metric. But is he wrong? I mean, can you say definitively that this metadata program has thwarted an attack? Well, uh, Kristen, what I can say is that uh, in the same way that building blocks are critical to the stability of a structure, building blocks are critical to the successful completion of an investigation. And I think that's what our national security professionals would tell you, is that they have used these tools in the past to collect information that they were previously not aware of. Uh, and that that information has been important to, the, to their activities that are critical to our security. Can you draw a direct Well, again, I think what I can do is I can illustrate to you that these programs are really important. Uh, and again, they are important building blocks to investigations that have uh, protected the American people. I think the other thing that I would say, Kristen, is that even if you assume the worst about what uh, some of our critics have said, they don't know what's going to happen in the future. Neither do I. And I guess the point is, why would we unnecessarily take the risk that someday in the, day, in the coming days, we could need access to that information and it could be critically important to our national security? Why would we take the risk of removing that tool from the toolbox uh, of our national security professionals, even though it includes the necessary reforms uh, that Senator Paul and others have called for. Can you give us a specific example of when this program has played out, has been a part of the building block that has thwarted an attack? Uh, these investigations are investigations that are conducted in a classified setting. So I, I don't have specifics that I can share with you in, uh, in this format. But our national security professionals have indicated that these programs are an important building block to their investigations. Uh, and that there has been information that has been obtained through these programs that they were previously unaware of, and that that newly obtained information was important to their investigations. And I, again, no one has presented a compelling explanation for why the United States and the American people should assume the risk associated with taking those tools out of the hands of our law enforcement professionals. And I want to circle back to the contingency plan. You say there's no contingency plan in place, but you're not suggesting that there aren't still tools in place. Um, that intelligence NSA officials have at their disposal. No, China. but I'm saying that if Congress doesn't act, if the Senate doesn't act uh, by the end of the day on Sunday, there are three important tools that our national security officials do currently have that they will not have uh, unless the, the Senate acts. And can you just look ahead for us over the next 48 hours? What will President Obama be doing? Is he going to be making phone calls directly to lawmakers on Capitol Hill, pressing them? to get this done? Well, I don't have any uh, presidential conversations to preview for you, but uh, certainly the President will be available when 
uh, members of the Senate do eventually return to Washington uh, after their week-long recess to consider this piece of legislation. The President stands ready to have conversations if necessary. I can tell you that members of the President's team and members of the President's uh, national security staff have been in touch uh, with members of Congress about this issue to make sure that they understand the, the, the stakes here. The stakes are significant. We're talking both about the basic civil liberties of the American people uh, and the national security of the United States. I, I guess what I'm saying is given the enormity, the argument that you're making, what's the strat how would you characterize the strategy from now through Sunday? Well, Kristen, I think what's really important for people to understand about this is we have already done the hard work of resolving these very complicated policy issues that a year and a half ago the President called for these reforms, and more than a year ago our national security professionals have been engaged uh, in difficult work with Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill to try to fashion a bipartisan compromise. And this isn't a matter of, uh, well, I'll give you, you know, half of this budget if you give me half of that budget. This is a situation where they're going through very complicated legal uh, uh, and national security policy issues some of which are affected by rapid uh, in, uh, changes in technology, to try to find a policy that both protects the ability of our national security professionals to keep us safe and protects the privacy and civil liberties of the American people. That's hard work. Good people, well-informed individuals who aren't influenced by politics can have a legitimate difference of opinion on, on, on these things. That makes it all the more remarkable that a House of Representatives that typically is racked by politics uh, was able to um, find this common ground and vote on it in a timely fashion uh, and yield 338 votes of Democrats and Republicans. That's, a, again, that's a, you don't often hear me doing this. That is a credit to the leadership uh, of Republicans uh, and Democrats uh, in the House of Representatives. And unfortunately, uh, on when it came the Senate's turn to take this up, we did see all the Democrats in the Senate do the right thing. They all did uh, try to vote in a timely fashion uh, for the USA Freedom Act. But because of the, you know, this, the latest installment of the Kentucky feud, uh, we haven't seen that critically important piece of legislation uh, ad advance in advance of the deadline. And just one more, Josh, on Iraq. Can you update us on the discussions, the reports that the administration is considering sending arms to Sunni fighters in Iraq? Well, Kristen, the, as you know, the President uh, and his team have been engaged for some time in training and equipping Iraqi security forces. And we have insisted from the beginning that the security forces in Iraq be multi-sectarian, that they need to reflect the diversity of that country. And that's why um, equipment supplied by the United States and our coalition partners uh, has benefited Kurdish security forces, uh, some Shia fighters in the Iraqi security forces, uh, and even some Sunni tribal fighters as well. Uh, all of that supplying uh, of equipment has been done through the Iraqi central government. Uh, and if there are things that we can do to make the flow of that equipment more efficient, to getting that equipment in the hands more quickly of the fighters who need it the most. Uh, we will we'll look for ways to do that, but we're going to make sure that that effort continues to be multi-sectarian uh, and that it is done under the auspices of the Iraqi central government. Yeah. Okay, Carol. Uh, can you go back to what you said on Cuba earlier where you okay. said there were additional issues um, that need to be worked out before embassies could open to that in Washington. Can you elaborate on that? What are those issues? Uh, I, I don't have a, a detailed readout of the of their conversations. As you know, there have been uh, a variety of issues that our diplomats have encountered as they've sought to uh, normalize relations between our two countries. Uh, they made some important progress, but um, the state sponsor of terror was uh, one stumbling block in those discussions. Uh, that's something that uh, should be resolved as of today. The, there have also been extensive discussions about what sort of limitations will be placed uh, on the activities of American diplomats on the island of Cuba. It is the, th this is the role of diplomats in countries all around the world, not just in Cuba, that they interact not just with government officials, but they also interact with, uh, with, with, the, with the people in the countries that they are, uh, where they are located. Uh, and that includes uh, meeting with citizens 
outside of the capital city. Uh, and it includes even meeting with citizens who aren't entirely supportive uh, of the political decisions that are being made by their government. And um, we want to make sure that our diplomats who, uh, if they're operating out of an embassy, an American embassy in Cuba, uh, do have the ability uh, to, uh, to do their jobs. And that includes uh, not just meeting with uh, government leaders, uh, but also involves uh, meeting with you know, with members of the, uh, with citizens of the population. Is there any uh, update on the likelihood that the president would travel to Cuba before he leaves office, or is that something he wants to leave to his successor? Uh, well, I think that uh, you could still characterize this as a presidential aspiration. Um, I guess it's a different sort of presidential aspiration than the one that has con consumed a lot of attention in this uh, room over the last few months. Uh, but it is, um, uh, you know, obviously it would be um, another milestone uh, in the effort to normalize uh, the relations between our two countries. Nadia. Thank you, Joe. I don't know if you have seen the debate at the Security Council today, but the Secretary General is saying basically that the number of foreign fighters who is fighting among ISIS in Iraq and Syria has risen to 25,000, <coughs> which, if, if I'm not wrong, is around 70 percent. Does that change the White House perspective into looking at the ISIS um, problem as an international one? Um, so are you considering changing the strategy of fighting them, considering that also that they attack in uh, Shiite mosques in Saudi Arabia now, so they're no longer a local in, in, area, in Syria and in Iraq? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there are a lot of questions there. Let me uh, try to do a couple of them. The, the first is that the President has made, um, has recognized the importance of shutting down the flow of foreign fighters uh, in our strategy to degrade and destroy ISIL. And you'll recall that uh, at the United Nations Security Council last fall, the President convened a meeting with other heads of state to talk exactly about this issue, about what countries all around the world could do uh, to prevent their citizens from uh, traveling to Iraq and Syria and taking up arms alongside uh, ISIL. Uh, the, the announcement, uh, while I can't speak to the veracity or the accuracy of that report, uh, it does highlight something that we've long acknowledged, that there is more that can and should be done to shut down the flow of foreign fighters to uh, Iraq and, and Syria. And we have been uh, in frequent touch with countries around the world about that ongoing effort. Now, the second thing that we have raised concerns about, and this may go more directly to uh, the incidents that we've seen in Saudi Arabia over the last week or so, that we continue to be concerned about the way that ISIL uses social media to incite and inspire people around the world to carry out acts of violence. Um, I can't speak to whether or not ISIL was involved uh, in the uh, attack that occurred earlier today in Saudi Arabia. I know that Saudi Arabian authorities have indicated that the attack that was carried out at a Shiite mosque last week uh, was the work of someone that was affiliated with ISIL. Um, yeah, and so the, the point is that um, we recognize that this is an important part of the strategy, too. Uh, and it's an element of the strategy that we take very seriously, and we work closely with the Saudis, in fact, uh, as we try to counter some of the radical um, messaging that we see from ISIL. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously uh, that is a very difficult business, particularly given the sophistication that ISIL has shown uh, in using social media tools. Uh, but that's something that we continue to be very aware of, uh, and we're going to continue to work closely with the Saudis and others to confront that element of the threat. I have another question. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, the last city in Idlib province, which is northern Syria, has fallen to the rebel hands, led by Jabhat al-Nusra. And I'm just wondering why the United States, or the coalition led by the United States, has not targeted Jabhat al-Nusra, who were al Qaeda affiliate, who considered him a terrorist organization. Is it because they're not plotting against the US, or is it because you want to put more pressure on Assad to compromise in a political transition? Well, Nadia, we have expressed significant concerns about the way in which a variety of extremist groups inside of Syria have sought to capitalize on the chaos in that country uh, to uh, set up operations in that country. Uh, that makes Syria a very dangerous place, not just to people who live in Syria, but to people who live throughout the region and potentially uh, to people around the world. Uh, and that's why you've seen the United States take some military action, not just against uh, ISIL fighters inside Syria, uh, but also against some other extremist elements inside Syria that may pose a more direct threat to the United States. Uh, and that's something that we have been engaged in since 
uh, the earliest days of our efforts inside of Syria. Uh, I was not aware of the most recent reports about uh, some of the gains that some groups had made in northern uh, Syria, but I have been uh, briefed on some of the advances that uh, Syrian Kurdish fighters and Assyrian uh, Christian fighters in Syria have made uh, in northeast Syria against ISIL. That there has been substantial territory that has um, been gained by those fighters who have been acting in coordination with our broader military coalition. That there are a number of coalition military airstrikes that have been taken in northeastern Syria in support of those efforts on the ground that have succeeded in driving back uh, ISIL. Uh, and again, that is a characteristic of the kind of uh, areas of progress and periods of setback that we've seen throughout this military conflict. Okay? Connie, Thanks. I'm calling on all the women who are wearing blue dresses and black blazers today. <laughs> so you'll get your turn. Uh, North Korean nuclear scientists are now in Iran helping develop nuclear weapons in Iran. Do you have anything on that? Uh, I don't, Connie. I haven't seen those reports, but I can uh, check with our national security team and see if they have information for you on that. Secondly, does the President believe that the U.S. still can conduct guns and butter at the same time? Does it give more priority to fighting terrorism or rebuilding the infrastructure? Well, uh, Connie, the President believes that we don't, uh, that we can do both, that we don't need to make sacrifices. Uh, and. Uh, in that regard, that we can successfully uh, devote the necessary resources to keep the American people safe uh, while investing in the kind of infrastructure uh, and in the kind of economy that will expand opportunity for all middle class families in this country. And um, you know, that does involve a set of strategic choices, uh, and our resources are not unlimited. Uh, but the President does believe that if uh, we are making wise, decisions consistent with our priorities, that we can take the steps that are necessary to protect the country uh, and take the steps that are necessary uh, to support the private sector as they uh, unleash uh, economic opportunity for every citizen in the United States. Okay. Leslie. Yeah. You look nice today, though. I wanted to ask you a couple questions about the President's visit yesterday with the Sotla family in Miami. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the hostage review, when that might be wrapped up, and is that going to be publicly shared? Uh, I don't have any update on the timing. Uh, this is obviously something that uh, our team has been engaged uh, in working on for uh, almost a year now, I believe. And um, I would anticipate that we'll have something relatively soon. Uh, and I don't know that every element of that review is something that we'll be able to make public, but we'll be able to offer some sort of public accounting uh, of the kinds of reforms that that review recommends. And I also wanted to ask you, um, the, uh, Stephen Sotloff's father had told the Miami Herald earlier this week that they got a lot of the letters from their son because of hostages that had been released because, and I'm quoting him, because their countries were responsible enough to pay a ransom to get their kids back. Do you know if he was that upfront with the president yesterday? Did that come up, a discussion on, on paying ransom? Uh, I, I did not travel with the president yesterday, so I did not uh, witness the meeting. But even if I did, uh, I wouldn't be in a position to talk about the, the details of their conversation. So we did offer a, what I would acknowledge is a very uh, um, top-line readout of the meeting, if you will. Uh, but the conversation that the president had with uh, the Sotlaw family is a private one. Okay. Uh, John. Thank you, Josh. Two, uh, well, go ahead, John. Uh, John, I'll do you next. Back-to-back so -back John's up there, so that makes it okay. challenging. First, Secretary Liu <coughs> said this morning that in, uh, in the matters involving a resolution of the Greek debt crisis, there has to be greater flexibility on all sides. Did he mean that the IMF should relax a little bit in requiring its payments or possibly renegotiate? Uh, what he meant, John, is that it's clearly in the interests of all the parties in these talks uh, to resolve their differences uh, and to come to uh, an agreement uh, that doesn't create undue turmoil in the financial markets. Uh, that's not in anybody's interest. Uh, and he's hopeful that, uh, that all of the parties will be able to sit down in good faith uh, and broker an agreement that satisfies their concerns. And that includes the IMF as one of the parties. Well, that, uh, obviously the, the IMF has been a part of the conversations here, and 
Uh, these kinds of multilateral institutions like the IMF have, have a role to play. The IMF has provided significant assistance to, the, uh, to, uh, to Greece, uh, and um, what Secretary Liu was urging is for all of the parties to come together and uh, to work out an agreement that doesn't cause undue uh, turmoil in the financial markets. Turning to the domestic front, it could be as early as next week that the Supreme Court comes down with a ruling in King v. Burwell. And Senator Cassidy of Louisiana said, of course, if it rules in favor of the administration, nothing happens. If it rules in favor of the plaintiff, there has to be an alternative plan. And he laid out his own Patient <coughs> Freedom Act that he said has many of the same goals as the Affordable Care Act does things a bit differently, like removes mandates, provides for greater competition. This was his presentation. Mm -hmm. Is the White House in touch with Senator Cassidy or any senators of either party or representatives who have alternative plans in case the court rules in favor of the plaintiff in the King v. Burwell case? Uh, John, I don't have any uh, conversations to, to tell you about. But I can tell you that the administration continues to be completely confident in the strength of the legal arguments that were presented to the Supreme Court. The fact is that if the Supreme Court um, does not uh, rule in favor of the arguments that were uh, made by the administration, it will cause significant turmoil in the, uh, in the health care markets. Uh, and uh, we will see uh, a lot of people's uh, affordable health care plans be put at risk. Uh, and there's no easy fix uh, to doing that, uh, particularly when you consider uh, how difficult it has been for common sense pieces of legislation to move through the Congress. Uh, something as controversial as health care, it's hard to imagine uh, any sort of legislative fix uh, passing through uh, that legislative body. So uh, we have, uh, but uh, that all being said, you know, we continue to have uh, a lot of confidence in legal arguments that we make, uh, that we've already made. Uh, and are hopeful uh, that the decision that's announced by the Supreme Court will reflect that, but obviously uh, they're a separate branch of government and they'll be the ones to decide. Thank Mr. Decker. You, Thank you, Josh. I want to ask you a little bit about the formal decision by the State Department to formally remove uh, Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. What leverage does the U.S. now have on Cuba going forward now that that has been um, eliminated as possible leverage to use against the government of Cuba? Well, the, uh, President Castro uh, and other representatives of the Cuban government have made no secret of the fact uh, that they are interested in normalizing relations with the United States. Uh, and obviously that some of that is a result of the kind of opportunity that they see in the United States. Uh, we obviously see important uh, opportunity uh, in Cuba. Uh, that if we succeed in uh, normalizing relations, that there will be additional opportunities for Americans to travel uh, to Cuba. There's obviously uh, additional opportunities for American businesses to do business in Cuba. That's why we've seen strong uh, bipartisan support for the President's uh, decision. Ultimately, what we think all of that will do uh, is empower the Cuban people. Uh, that is the ultimate goal uh, of this policy change. Uh, and. There's no question that the, um, that the deeper engagement that we hope will be the result of this policy change between uh, our two countries and between uh, the people of our two countries, uh, that that will empower the Cuban people and put additional pressure uh, on the Cuban government to do a better job of respecting and protecting the basic uh, human rights of their people. There are a number of American citizens who are living freely in Cuba, who are wanted by U.S. authorities here, including a woman who killed a New Jersey state trooper. Uh, has that particular case ever been brought up as a way to tie together these various issues of, including this one, of removing Cuba from its list of state sponsors of terrorism? Uh, John, I'd refer you to the State Department for a more detailed uh, description of the kinds of, of issues that were discussed between the diplomats when they were here. Final um, question as it relates to this. Uh, Cuba, because of the action taken by the State Department formally today, is now eligible for foreign assistance. Is there any plan by President Obama to propose that Cuba receives foreign assistance from the United States? 
Uh, nothing that I'm aware of at this point, but if that changes, we'll obviously let you know. Jordan. Thanks, Josh. Uh, on the AUMF, Senator Corker was quoted yesterday as saying that uh, it's basically an intellectual exercise that's not going to have bearing on what happens on the ground. And even Senator Reid said that he doesn't think there's a need to pass a new AUMF for ISIS. Um, do you have any reaction to those comments? And has the White House considered redrafting the AUMF and sending a new one to the Hill? Well, Jordan, the, the President has been very clear about why he believes it's important for uh, the United States Congress uh, to path pass an authorization to use military force against ISIL. Uh, we have, you've heard me say, and the President has indicated as well, that passing an authorization to use military force would send a very clear signal to the American people, to our men and women in uniform, to our allies around the globe, and even to our adversaries in ISIL, that the country is united behind the strategy that the President has put forward. Uh, and Senator Corker himself said the same thing. Uh, he wrote an op-ed at the end of last year, I believe, uh, indicating um, that unless the President reverses course and requests congressional backing, our efforts to confront ISIL risk failure without the long-term domestic political support necessary for a multi-year campaign in at least two countries. He continued to say, we, are, we would be stronger and our actions against ISIL more effective if the President requested authorization. As you guys know, the President requested authorization. The President and his national security team uh, are certainly doing their job uh, to confront the threat that is posed by ISIL uh, in terms of laying out a strategy and building out a 60-nation coalition to execute it. No one doubts that our men and women in uniform are doing their important job uh, at some in, and in some cases at substantial risk to themselves to carry out and execute this strategy. But when it comes to passing an authorization to use military force, something that Senator Corker says would make our campaign against ISIL, quote, more effective, the United States Congress has been AWOL. They haven't been willing to stand up and do their job. Their job doesn't require putting themselves at great personal risk. Their job doesn't require making difficult strategic decisions. Their job requires holding some congressional hearings, writing legislation, and casting a vote. Their job requires basically only fulfilling the bare minimum. And when it comes to our national security and something as important as this, something that they say is so critically important to our country, it's time for them to uh, not just pay lip service, but to actually follow through with some action. Right, but it seems there's no appetite for the draft that was submitted by the White House and now among members of both parties. So has there been any thought to making tweaks and sending a new one up to the Hill that might address some of the concerns? Jordan, Senator Corbyn? Jordan we've, we've been clear from the second that we submitted that authorization that it could be used as the starting point for negotiations, that we're open to discussions uh, about uh, adjustments and refinements that could be made to that legislative proposal. But we haven't even seen Congress be willing to do that. Even aggressive members of Congress who made an aggressive case for the President to submit an authorization to use military force. The Congress has held meetings, uh, has held a couple of congressional hearings that have been attended by the most senior members of the President's national security team. So the, the administration has already demonstrated a clear willingness to engage in this discussion. We had a, a number of discussions before we submitted the authorization, our, our draft authorization. We did so indicating a willingness to engage in future conversations. Uh, and the president even dispatched a senior member of his national security team to testify in public on the record about the authorization to use military force. But yet all we've seen from Congress is some idle chatter uh, surely our campaign against ISIL deserves more than that. Uh, and I know we all agree that our men and women in uniform de deserve a lot more than that. Kevin. Josh. Thank you. Uh, just a little Cuba house cle uh, cleaning really fast, and then just two questions. We can wrap it up. Would you say it is more likely than not that at the end of June? I'm not sure your colleagues in the back would agree with that. Yeah, 
<laughs> you can take it up with them separately. 80, 90, 100 minutes. I mean, at this point, I'm just glad you called them. Good. 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 Um, Don't make me regret it, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> you may now. Now you may. Absolutely. That would be really fun. Uh, would you say it's more likely than not that sometime before the end of June that uh, the White House would announce uh, embassy openings, uh, both in Havana and in Washington, and announce a presidential trip to the island. Uh, I, I don't have a time frame for you in, uh, in terms of a, an announcement about, uh, about embassy openings. Uh, when it comes to the president's travel, I wouldn't anticipate uh, any sort of travel in the near future. Uh, but the president does have, um, I think, a previously stated aspiration to travel to Cuba. Uh, but I don't know if that will happen before the end of his presidency or not. Okay. Uh, would you say, um, or I guess, how would you characterize the legislative shop here at the White House. How active were they in the 45-day period trying to head off any possible uh, uh, blowback from Congress? Uh, I don't know that there were a whole lot of discussions on this particular topic. We saw that some of the President's most aggressive critics uh, of this policy change, uh, even they were pretty forthright in indicating that there was not a lot of public support for uh, trying to prevent uh, the removal of Cuba from the state sponsored terror list. So there wasn't a particularly uh, aggressive campaign uh, on the other side on this issue. So I don't know that there were that many discussions about it. Uh, the Attorney General coming and meeting with the President, is it your impression that they'll talk about the Lois Lerner uh, circumstance? Uh, you may remember back in March the U.S. Attorney for the District uh, declined to move forward uh, in one aspect, but not in all aspects. Perhaps criminal activity has happened. Uh, do you think that will be on the conversation uh, list? between the President uh, and the Attorney General? I doubt it. Yeah. Uh, lastly, for me uh, and for all the uh, sports fans out there, uh, a lot of people, whether you're watching Fox Sports or ESPN or just following the President on Twitter, they'll want to know, who's he got? Warriors, Cavs, NBA Finals. Well, the President uh, has talked publicly of, of, his, um, uh, of the degree to which he is impressed by LeBron James. Uh, and um, so, but, but uh, the president has also said similarly complimentary things about uh, Steph Curry, too. So I know the president's really looking forward to the offensive skills that will be on display uh, in the NBA Finals this year. But I don't know that uh, since, his in, since his Chicago Bulls are not uh, in the finals, I don't know that he's going to be picking sides this time. All right. We'll just do a couple more. Uh, let's see. Steve. Uh, China, a lot of uh, heating up and rhetoric about the uh, Spratleys. It doesn't sound like China wants to uh, withdraw or pull back. So what are we prepared to do in the coming days and weeks in terms of uh, troop movements and flights and treatment of that, that area that we call international space? What, what are we prepared to, to do to demonstrate that we uh, want to treat it that way no matter what they're doing? See, there have been some reports about uh, some uh, recently developed intelligence in that uh, area of the world. Uh, I'm not in a position to confirm those specific reports. Uh, so I can't speak about that, but I can uh, indicate that we continue to be very concerned uh, about recent developments in the South China Sea, particularly the large-scale land reclamation that China has been engaged in in that region of the world. Um, we've been clear that all the claimants uh, in the South China Sea, including China, uh, that we're, that the United States opposes any further militarization of outposts in disputed areas of the South China Sea. Uh, and we continue to urge all of the claimants, again including China, to avoid any actions that escalate tensions in that region of the world. Uh, the President has indicated that we have a genuine interest in that region of the world because it is the site of so much uh, international commerce. Uh, and disruption of the free flow of commerce in the South China Sea would have a significant impact on the global economy and would have an impact uh, on the U.S. economy uh, as well. That's why uh, the United States uh, has sought to try to play a role to facilitate uh, a resolution of these disputes through diplomacy uh, among all of the parties. China has said we're just meddling. They've, they've indicated that, but that's uh, in anticipating that line of their, their line of argument on this. That's why I, uh, I tried to be clear about uh, what the president has said about the U.S. interest in this region of the world. This is the site of um, of extensive 
uh, international commerce. Uh, and disrupting that international commerce uh, would have a, a destabilizing impact on the global economy, and that would have an impact on the, on the U.S. economy. Uh, obviously, American businesses do a decent amount of businesses, a, a decent amount of business in that region of the world. Uh, if we can succeed in getting a Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, um, then American businesses will be doing uh, even more business in that region of the world. Uh, but uh, that, is what our, that is what our interest is. We do not intend to resolve our concerns about that interest through the use of our military might. Uh, we uh, intend to encourage all of the direct claimants uh, in the South China Sea uh, to facilitate uh, diplomatic discussions that would allow for uh, a resolution of their differences. To, I thought that there was some discussion about the United States you know, Navy going through some of those waters or, or reconnaissance flights over that area. Well, there obviously is a, a U.S. military presence in that region of the world, and uh, China has on occasion interpreted uh, the movement of those military assets uh, as, a, as, as a threat to their claim. Uh, but what the United States military would be happy to tell you, these are principally Navy assets, uh, is that they're operating in international waters consistent with uh, widely acknowledged uh, international rules and norms. Um, I wouldn't rule out that sort of movement here. I'd refer you to the Department of Defense on that. Uh, but what they will tell you, is what I will tell you, is that um, while that may occur, uh, that's not how we're going to resolve the differences here. The way we're going to resolve the differences is for all of the, compl all of the claimants in the South China Sea uh, to sit down and try to resolve their differences through diplomacy. Okay? Uh, Sarah, I'll give you the last one, then we'll do the week ahead. Um, you, uh, you characterize the situation in the Senate as being because of a feud uh, between the two Kentucky senators. And I'm wondering if, in the view of the White House, if that solely explains the, the situation that we're in, or if there are other issues with uh, Senator McConnell's leadership as majority leader or other factors. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, we have a situation where a piece of legislation got strong bipartisan support in the House of Representatives. It's a piece of legislation dealing with complicated policy issues. Uh, but I wouldn't just dismiss the policy issues as complicated. They're critically important to our country. They are uh, important to our national security uh, and important to the civil liberties of, uh, of American citizens. This should be a top priority. Uh, and the fact that our national security establishment, lawyers from the Department of Justice, senior administration officials, including the President, we're engaged in discussions with Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill to try to find a bipartisan compromise, something that Congress has struggled to find uh, over the last four or five years. Uh, but because the stakes were so high, bipartisan ground was hammered out in the House. And uh, it's been very disappointing uh, to the President, and I think it's pretty disappointing to the American people that something that is clearly so important to our country is for reasons that are so unclear being blocked in the Senate by Republicans. And for a variety of reasons. Uh, again, there are some Republicans who say that it's critically important to protect these authorities and they're blocking the USA Freedom Act. But the USA Freedom Act actually extends those authorities. Blocking the USA Freedom Act actually is the surest way to uh, result uh, or to take away those authorities that our national security professionals say that they need. There are others in the Republican Party who say that they are concerned about, the, about protecting the privacy and civil liberties of the American people. That's exactly what the USA Freedom Act would protect. Uh, and uh, to block this piece of legislation prevents those from protections from being passed into law. So uh, that is why uh, you've heard me say and others say that, we, that there's no rational explanation for the tactics that are currently being used by Republicans in the Senate to block the passage of this bill. Uh, and we're hopeful that after a, a, a week-long break uh, that Republicans in the Senate will come back ready to act on a piece of legislation that will protect our privacy and civil liberties uh, and will ensure that there is no lapse in these authorities that our national security professionals say are critical to keep in the country safe. Do you see Senator McConnell as a weak majority leader? Uh, I wouldn't um, uh, put myself in a position at this point to, um, uh, to pass that kind of judgment. Uh, I think that, um, well, I think what I would say is that uh, Senator McConnell would want to be judged by his record. Uh, and 
Uh, that's a record that, um, that, that uh, as is the case with all politicians, uh, that we'll, uh, we'll have uh, an opportunity to evaluate that record in public. Okay? Let's do a week ahead, and then I will um, let at least some of you get an early start on your weekend, I hope. On Monday, uh, the President will host Their Majesties King Wilhelm Alexander and Queen Maxima of the Netherlands for a meeting in the Oval Office. Their visit reinforces the strong and enduring ties between the United States and the Netherlands that stretches back more than 400 years. In the afternoon, the President will host a discussion at the White House with a group of 75 young Southeast Asian leaders on themes of civic engagement, the environment, and natural resources management and entrepreneurship. The group is the first cohort from the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative Fellows Program. The fellows, ranging in age from 18 to 35, hail from all 10 ASEAN countries and have just completed their five-week fellowship in the United States to enhance their practical expertise, leadership skills, and professional contacts uh, that they'll use to address challenges and create new opportunities in their home communities and countries. On Tuesday, the President will award the Medal of Honor to Army Sergeant William Shemin and Army Private Henry Johnson for conspicuous gallantry during World War I. Uh, on Wednesday, the President will attend meetings at the White House uh, and then on Thursday, the President will welcome the World Series champion San Francisco Giants to the White House to honor their team and the 2014 World Series victory. The President will recognize uh, the efforts of the Giants um, to give back to their community as part of their visit, continuing the tradition begun by President Obama of honoring sports teams for their efforts on the field uh, and off. And certainly the San Francisco Giants uh, performed very well on the field uh, in last year's playoffs. Is that hard to use that? No, nope, it's not. <laughs> they're, they're deserving of all of the attention that, they, uh, that they'll receive next week. So that'll be good. Uh, on, Friday, uh, on Friday, the President will attend meetings at the White House. So with that, I bid you all a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.